Here the air escapes between the discs and is rotated with these earlobe-shaped guide vanes. Schauberger's central approach here was the principle of matter transformation. The elements of the air, particulate matter and gases are converted in this repulsator, which is what we call the core of this repulsin. With this transformation, the different elements group together and are separated out. One part escapes through the ring rotator. And the radiation energy, Schauberger talks about synthesis electricity, is emitted through the central axis. That's why he also planned to incorporate this machine in aeroplanes as an alternative to the propeller for propulsion. Basically, the repulsin creates a biological vacuum along the axis in front of it, into which the aeroplane is sucked. Like the trout that's basically sucked through a vortex. A revolutionary propulsion concept. The question of what happened to Victor Schauberger's last repulsing becomes even more interesting. In June 2002, the American Richard Feierabend appeared unexpectedly at a seminar in Bad Ischl. He showed pictures of the repulsing which he had rediscovered in Texas. Feierabend was a US Marine pilot. Colleagues had told him the mythology surrounding Victor Schauberger's flying discs. One of the speakers at the same seminar was the Englishman Callum Coates. He and Feierabend got to know one another as Coates had written the first English language book about Victor Schauberger. Callum Coates is an architect and Schauberger researcher who lives in Australia and who translated numerous of Victor's texts into English. Victor's wording was specific and very often difficult to understand, so it was a tough undertaking. In the chapter, What Happened in America, Coates reconstructed the exact events of the summer of 1958. In the Schauberger archive in Bad Ischl, Ingrid Schauberger presents Victor's correspondence from that time. These are the last original documents from Victor Schauberger's life. With this knowledge, his grandson Jörg went to America in April 2004. First stop was Fredericksburg in Virginia, the home of the Feierabend family. Richard Feierabend had unfortunately since died. Jörg Schauberger was welcomed by his widow, Patty. Hey. Patty Feierabend showed all the documents which her husband had been able to secure and which have not yet found their way to Europe. Here are all the original documents that Dick Feierabend collected from Texas. I'm very surprised about the abundance of the material. One can see here some original photographs, as well as the legendary purple report, the paper that was written at the University of Stuttgart in 1952. We've seen copies of it, but this paper has the original signature of the professor on it, so it's also of great interest to Schauberger research. Tell your mom, hello, Ingrid, hello, children, hello. It was already late when Jörg Schauberger said goodbye to Patty Feierabend, but he had not yet seen the repulsing. The journey continued the next day to Austin, the state capital of Texas. Jörg Schauberger visited an institute that specializes in future technologies. The research ranges from cold fusion to so-called zero-point energy. Its client list includes the American space agency, NASA. And here it stands on the test bench. Victor Schauberger's repulsing from the year 1945. Richard Feierabend had brought the machine back to Texas shortly before he died. He wanted to know whether it could produce a lift. In other words, overcome the force of gravity. Hal Puthoff 
head of institute and a renowned experimental physicist, showed Jörg Schauberger the test stand. Puthoff's colleague, Scott Little, used a stroboscope lamp to test whether the material would be deformed with a rising speed of revolution. At 2,000 revolutions per minute, the tests were aborted. There was concern that the half-century-old machine would fly apart. I must say, one of the things I was impressed with was uh, the quality of the construction, considering it was from the 40s and... Uh, for example, when we put it on its bearings and spun it around, it spun very freely, as, as good as any modern bearings, actually. And so uh, I could see that its uh, function was to generate some kind of vortex airflow. And so what we wanted to do is look to see if, uh, when it was spun at high speeds, <coughs> whether it would generate any, any lift. And what was the result of your test? Unfortunately, uh, we didn't uh, see any lift. Now, <clears throat> there are two aspects of this that we wondered about after the fact, and that is we only had pictures of the device uh, before we received it, and there were at least two parts of the device that uh, were not provided us. One of the parts we had pictures of, photos of, and so we were able to fabricate that uh, part of the device to add to what was sent to us. And then there was another smaller cap that we had no information on its structure. It wouldn't look like it would pay, play a major role, but you know, we can't be sure. So when we didn't see a good effect, we didn't know if perhaps uh, we were still missing a significant part. Like this, and with tools. For the first time, Jörg Schauberger saw the interior of his grandfather's last repulsing. What is his conclusion? Well, what we had hoped for from Schauberger's flying saucers did not happen, unfortunately. But it has to be said that not all the parts were there. Victor Schauberger had said that the catalysts in particular were essential for his machine to move in a way that corresponds to nature, and these were missing. We should have been able to obtain energy without wasting resources, with machines that run on only water and air. We'll see what comes out of this. So, it will be back to the drawing board for a while before we can publish new findings. Jörg Schauberger has a different aim at the moment. He is following his father and grandfather's footsteps to the Texas-Oklahoma border, to the Red River of Western movies. On the 1st of July 1958, Victor boarded an aeroplane from New York to Dallas, Texas, accompanied by his son Walter and his son-in-law, Dr. Walter Lueb. Some American business people had invited them to stay, especially the German-born American Karl Gersheimer. He saw that there was no future in explosion technology. He had heard of Victor's concepts of virtually free energy production. He wanted to develop and market these ideas in the land of opportunity. With the backing of a wealthy U.S. financier, the project could start in Texas. So, in the summer of 1958, Victor and Walter Schauberger came to a remote, semi-desert area in the north of Texas. 73-year-old Victor had difficulty with the oppressive heat but he hoped to be able to complete his life's work here. Grandson Jörg looks for clues. The only photograph of his father and grandfather together in Texas. Jörg goes on to Denison, the birthplace of the former US President Dwight D. Eisenhower. This is a postcard of the house President Eisenhower was born in. It shows the house as it looked in 1958, 
when my father wrote this card to us back home. It was July 1958 where he wrote, we're doing really well, we're in high spirits. So that was the beginning of the expedition to the USA, my grandfather's and father's American adventure. Jörg drives into the small town nearby, Sherman. Karl Gersheimer had a business associate here, Harold Totten. He owned a foundry that produced tubes and drill pipes for oil and gas production. The firm is still owned by the Totten family and is still called the Washington Iron Works. When I got out of the car and walked into the office of the Washington Iron Works for the first time, I felt a little uncertain. We tried to get in touch via email, but we didn't receive an answer. So I wasn't sure what kind of welcome I'd get. But the chief executive of the firm was friendly, and Jörg could move freely around the factory. He found the old factory shed where Schauberger's machines were to be built. Unfortunately, this never happened. The prototypes from Austria arrived only after a two-month delay and were not handled with care. A few pieces ended up later in Karl Gersheimer's garage, where they were found by Richard Feierabend many years later. Wally Totten, the current boss of Washington Ironworks, showed Jörg his manufacturing plant, where they make precision parts out of aluminium. Wally Totten can still remember Victor Schauberger very well because of his full beard, which reminded him rather of Santa Claus. As he was a trainee at that time, he could not remember the project itself. His father told him some details later, especially about Karl Gersheimer, the initiator of the project. My grandfather and my father. Yes. Um, and? My father was very bitter about the way Carl handled particularly the relationship because he he really felt that uh, Carl was the one that that caused the project not to work uh, uh, and nobody really knows why but uh, m my father was uh, was very very uh, uh, convinced that Carl was uh, uh, was a very negative influence on that on that whole situation and as I say was a Carl also seemed to spread some some distrust amongst the other people. Jörg Schauberger is not surprised because he knows that the Texas project ended in a fiasco. After a few weeks, communication problems and misunderstandings led to the breakdown of mutual trust. Victor refused to stay here in Texas any longer than three months. In this diner, Victor and Walter Schauberger used to have their breakfast. Afterwards, boss Wally Totten takes Jörg in his Porsche to his family's former country home, about 10 kilometers outside Sherman. This is where the Austrian inventors stayed. The Totten family sold the property some 20 years ago. Today, it is pretty run down. Wally Totten was sorry about that because in 1958 it looked quite different. At, uh, at that time my father kept it very much like a golf course. Uh, it was a, a wooden rail fence around the property. It was kept mowed and trimmed and we had horses and cows and, and that sort of thing. It was, it was a working farm but uh, very neat unlike the way you see it now. It breaks my heart to see it this way. Uh, I'm glad my father can't see it. <laughs> Here, Victor and Walter Schauberger spent most of their time during their stay in Texas. They wrote letters and essays and drew project sketches. But the Americans seemed suddenly to have lost interest in them. In the first days and weeks, they were still very optimistic and full of confidence that the project would provide the breakthrough and that they would be successful here in the USA. As the weeks went by and with nothing to do out here, the letters got more and more pessimistic until a point was reached where it couldn't go on anymore. Punkt erreicht war, wo es nicht mehr weitergegangen ist. 
In the end, my grandfather signed a contract in which he transferred the rights to all his ideas, all his patents and thoughts to an American consortium, just so that he could fly back home again. And as you know, five days later, after he was back home, he died. I saw him as a man of great insight. 